So I wanted to focus on the part of the chapter that talks about God creating uh, all men everywhere of one blood. So I just want to give you your thoughts because you know what's happening in the news right now is all the Black Lives Matter protests. So I thought I'd give you my thoughts on what's happening in Black Lives Matter and why, why I have a problem with the whole Black Lives Matter message. So first of all, I'll just go through that and then I will talk about uh, you know, racism in light of the Bible. And um, for those of you who know your Bibles well, um, you will know the answer there. So first of all, I just want to give you some thoughts on what I think about Black Lives Matter on the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, if it, if it were about police brutality and justice, then, you know, obviously that is a, that's a noble cause, right? Like, you know, you don't want the police to overstep their mark. You don't want people to be brutalized by the police. And especially, you know, anytime somebody is and you look at the case of uh, George Floyd, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tragic thing that somebody who did not deserve to die, you know, was not, was not committing anything worthy of death, has now lost his life. And people uh, are upset, and rightly so. But the thing is, what does that have to do with his skin color? You know, like if, if it's about police brutality, it's a, if it's about injustice, then skin color uh, wouldn't matter because we should be equally upset if the person was light skinned or brown skinned or whether they were Asian it wouldn't make a difference but you know obviously people but see when when you say something like all lives matter then people are saying people will say oh you know well you know are you ignoring the fact that things are happening to people of darker skin so what do people say to this what do people respond to this black lives matter movement they'll say well all lives matter and then what do they say well they say well we're not saying that all lives don't matter what they're saying is something is happening to a certain group of people disproportionately to other people. So these are the issues, right? So then the question is, well, is something happening disproportionately to a group of people that is not happening to other people? And then the other question is, well, even if the stats show that something is happening to a certain demographic, is it based purely on their skin color or their other contributing factors? So people have these debates going back and forth, and this is why not everybody agrees with the Black Lives Matter movement, but they're, it's, a, it's a multifaceted movement, right? Some people are there because they're upset at police brutality, and rightly so, when things like that happen. But there are other people as well that are pushing a racial agenda. And for those people that are pushing a racial agenda and thinking that everything is only done based on people's skin color and trying to say that there's a disproportionately amount of crime or have something happening to a certain skin color, well, then the debate is about, well, is that even really happening? But I'm not here to argue about, you know, the stats and all that stuff today. To me, my problem with the Blacks, Black Lives Matter movement is the acceptance of the concept of races. You know, when we look in the Bible, there is no such thing as races. So I want to just give you a uh, thought about that. Even, even the inconsistency of people talking about Black Lives Matter, because think about it. If it... If, it, if, it, if, it, if Black Lives Matter isn't about the color of your skin, then that's fine. You know, I'm all for, you know, against police brutality and putting the police in their place, making sure, you know, even with uh, the things I've been doing, it's about, hey, is the police overstepping the mark? Is the government overstepping their mark? So, but if it, if it is about the color of the skin, then the question is, if Black Lives Matter, then what does, what does it even mean to be black? I mean, you, have, you would have to define what it means to be black in order to say Black Lives Matter, to exclude people from that saying at all. So think, think about this for a second. If Black Lives Matter, what makes a person black? Right? You say, well, is it the color of, the skin? Is it the color of their skin? Is that what makes them black? Well, then my question is, well, why is anyone even called white? Because the people that would be considered white in the room, your skin is not white. I mean, it's pink, it's different shades of brown. I mean, what am I? People say I'm yellow. Am I yellow? I mean, I'm probably pinker than some of you guys in this room. I may be whiter than some of you, but then why, why are Asians designated the yellow color? Why are India? So it's like, well, what is this black and white? If, if somebody is black skinned, well, then who's white skinned? Because nobody is like the, the whiteness of a, of a white piece of paper or the wall. So you see how there's just this scale that people have just arbitrarily determined somewhere that white begins and yellow begins and black begins. So why is ever anyone even called white? I mean, skin color 
is determined by the amount of melanin in your skin. So if you, if you really want to be technical, we all have the same skin color. We're just sh different shades of the same color. But what about, for example, Elizabeth? You know, would you consider Elizabeth black skinned? Did you know that Elizabeth was a quarter African? That's <laughs> something I learned. But would you say, oh, is, is Elizabeth included in this Black Lives Matter? Like if Elizabeth starts saying black, people will be like, what? You're, you're Mexican. Why did Black Lives Matter? But Elizabeth is probably blacker than some of the Aboriginals I've seen in my lifetime. Right? Because if you look at Abri the Aboriginals as well, they, they're not always as black as the Africans. You know, you see them protesting and whatnot. And sometimes I've seen Aboriginals that are lighter skinned than people like Elizabeth. And yet Elizabeth wouldn't be considered in the Black Lives Matter movement. So then it begs the question, well, is it about a nationality? Is it about a certain type of black people rather than just all dark skinned people? So is it about the color of the skin? Remember guys, when it comes from whatever you determine as black and whatever you determine as white, there is an infinite amount of shades of brown in between. So who decide, where is that line drawn along? If it's purely based on the, on the appearance of the skin, where does, where does that line get drawn? Where does all of a sudden you are no longer black and now you're white? Or you are no longer white, you're yellow. And you know, this, you know, it's like Asians, Asians are out of this conversation. It doesn't matter if you're Asian, you're irrelevant because this is blacks versus whites. But then the question is, well, where, where along that scale? So you see, if black, that's why to me, if it's not about skin color, then the color is irrelevant. Right? Because then what, if you say, well, it's, it's black lives matter, well, who's black? Right? Is it based on the skin color? If it's not based on the skin color, let's say it's based on your nationality. Right? Let's say, because that's what they're making it about. Now are the first people's nation and the aboriginals going out and then they're making the black lives matter about oh, you know, a certain nation, a certain ethnicity of people is being persecuted. But when it comes to nations, do you know people of all shades of skin color can be part of a nation? I mean, if we talk about this, we're all Australians, you know, and we're all different skin, all different hair colors. So if it's about the nationality, again, why would it be Black Lives Matter? Wouldn't it then be Aboriginal Lives Matter, you know, or something like that, or, you know, African Lives Matter? So again, how do you define uh, what black is? Uh, and then, it, you know, if it was about nationality, it would no longer be about skin color, right? It would just be about na different nations. Um, what about genetic attributes? You say, well, you know, when it comes to races, it's people that have common genetic attributes. Well, sure, there may be common attributes for a certain population that lives somewhere because, you know, that's what happens. People divide up and maybe a certain population finds certain attributes attractive, you know, whether it's tall, dark, and handsome, you know, and then they, you know, breed more often, right? And then that population starts tending towards those attributes and say, well, that's what sort of determines a race, you know? And they say, well, these different races are more, you know, dependent on the different attributes that we find these people have, you know, black people more athletic, you know, this group of people is, is smarter and whatnot. But if that's what determines race, then what, what, what happens when you have an interracial marriage? Now what is the race of the offspring? Right, so, when you have inter so then it's still a blending of what's going on and then there's no definite line between, hey, there is this certain people and this certain people. Right? Because if, if we do have the evolutionary mindset that people are of technically of different races, different species, they shouldn't be able to interbreed. But the fact is, humans are all the one kind, and we all interbreed. And when you interbreed, where then does this race end, start and end? I mean, like with the color of your skin, how pure-blooded do you need to be to still be part of that race? So let's say it's about your, your genetic composition, but then you have interracial marriage, you have you know, people marrying who have different attributes. At what point do you go from one to another? Because everybody's a mix of all different things. So how pure-blooded do you need to be until you're no longer considered a part of a, of a race? And then the question is, well, if it's genetic, then where did it begin? When did, that, when did that race start if it's about genetics? Because how far do you go back, right? And if you go back far enough, 
that breaks the question and we're sort of getting into what we're going to talk about in the Bible today is if, if it is about who you descend from, if that's what races supposedly are, and it's about a certain family that you're a part of, well then one question is, well what makes one person's family so targeted? You know, what happens when a family becomes so diverse that you have different skin shades within that family? And then there's another question of, well how far do you go back? Because for those of us that accept biblical history, if you go back far enough, obviously we are all part of the same family. And this is why I reject you know, racism and this idea of Black Lives Matter because why does the color even matter if you're against a certain cause? And if it's about skin color or race, well then I reject the, the fact that different races and different um, you know, colors of skin you know, even determine differences between each other because we're all the same you know, in terms of uh, the color of our skin. It's just the amount of melanin in our skin. What makes us different is the different cultures that we're a part of, right? The different nations we're a part of, you know, and, and things like that. So racism is an evolutionary concept. It's not a biblical one, right? You never see races dealt with in the Bible. All you see are nations. And that's what I want to show you guys today. So we'll go all the way back to Genesis and we see in the Bible that there is only one race. It's the human race. So when God created man, we all come from that same one man and one woman. Genesis 1.26 And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. This is why it's so important that people believe that Genesis is literal history. Because people that deny Genesis is literal history and try and fit millions of years and evolutionary concepts to Genesis come up with theories like the day age theory and the gap theory and, and accept this idea of evolution they're taking away the, the very solid position in the Bible that there are no such thing as races. Because where do races come from? Races come from this idea that different people are, are like evolved to different stages and some people have evolved further than others and the whole idea is that people of light skin have evolved further than people of black skin, you know, of darker skin. So if we understand that Genesis is literal history then people will realize, well then how, you wouldn't consider somebody within your own family a different race. And when we realize we are all part of one big family physically, then there is no such thing as races. Now one thing I always like to point out in this verse is it's always interesting to note that, that man is created in God's image, not women. Right? So it's not that, it's not talking about the value of our life. And that's where people, we, we don't want to keep, in my mind, I don't want to keep repeating these things that people always say, oh, you know, the value of human life is because everyone's created in God's image, when it's not actually true. You know, we are not, we are not all created in God's image because the created in God's image is referring to physically, like actually looking like a man, right? So that's why man is created in God's image. Woman is not created in God's image because women don't look like men, right? They look like women. They were created with, with man as the glory of them. But people get this idea that our value comes from the fact that we are created in God's image. No, our value just comes because we are, val we are humans, right? We're humans have a value of life. We are created similar to God in the sense that God is three parts and we are three parts. You know, body, soul, spirit. God is Father, Word, Holy Ghost. So there are... There's those elements that are similar, but when it comes to actually being created in the image of God, you can see here, it's very clear in this passage, he says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, right? Male and female created he them. And this concept is further reiterated in 1 Corinthians 11. It says, for man indeed not to, ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So notice, even in Corinthians, when Paul reaffirms that truth, he's saying, hey, yes, man is created in the image of God, 
Woman was created for the glory of man. But like I said, this has nothing to do with the value of human life, right? It's talking about how they look. Now, when it comes to the spiritual side, everybody, when they are born again, is in the image of God because the spiritual side doesn't have this physical appearance. And who do we look like? I'm not too sure. You know, will we all look very similar? Will there still be genders? Um, th those sort of questions people talk about, and I'm not 100% sure of all the different answers. I have thoughts there, but I won't talk about that now. All right, Genesis 2. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And, the, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So God makes man in his image, creates woman from the rib of the man. And uh, you know, obviously there is some symbolism there where people say, oh, you know, it's created from the rib of the man. It's meant to be under the protective wing. Uh, of the man and whatnot and people ask things like oh how come you know people ask silly questions like well if uh, Adam had his rib removed you know how come men don't have one rib less and everything like that and it's like that's not how genetics works you know if you cut your finger off it doesn't mean all your children only have nine fingers so it's just like people say things like that not really thinking about it. that's not how it works you know so yeah no men don't have one rib less than women <laughs> uh, Genesis 3 Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. See, so the Bible is very clear that we all come from Adam and Eve. And even less so, you know, obviously the, the, the world multiplied and then it came to what? Noah's Ark. So we all have the common ancestor, Adam and Eve, and then it spreads out and then it comes back to Noah's Ark when everybody was destroyed and eight people went onto the ark. So we know here in Genesis 6, and behold, I... Even I do bring a flood upon waters, a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons wives with thee. Genesis 7.13, we're told who those people are that went into the ark. Genesis 7.13 says, In the self same day entered Noah, and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. Now, some people think that, because we don't know what Shem, Ham, and Japheth looked like, right? But some people think, or maybe, you know, I, I can't remember all the different, maybe Shem was like the light skinned brother, and, you know, I think Ham is, it was Ham like the dark skinned brother, and then Japheth is like the, the slanty eyed, black haired brother. You know, so, you know, is the, are these like where the three main looks come from? You know, that's some people think that, but who knows? But the fact of the matter is they were all one family. So if you say like, well, they're different races and different. Well, here at this point, even if they had different looks, they were all sons of Noah, all the same, same family. So even if their individual attributes that they inherited from, from Noah and his wife, well, you know, just like my children, my, some might be darker, some might be lighter. You know, Noah's got more the Asian eyes. Uh, you know, Simon's got the, you know, the big, the big eyes. And then they s separated off and, you know, had children and whatnot. You would start to see those genetic differences come out. But they're not different races. You know, at one point, it was all the same family. So, Jesus acknowledges... Genesis as literal history. So some people, this is why it's so important that we understand Genesis as literal history. And I'm so appreciative of the Answers in Genesis movement, you know, the Creation Ministries movement, the, the people that have devoted and dedicated their life to combat the science, you know, or the so-called science of evolution. And uh, scientists have gone on board and things like that. You know, you kind of think it was, you know, it, oh, Christians are always reacting, you know, they're never proactive. And uh, that's the thing. It's even with the evolutionary movement, all this destruction happened. People are talked into believing all these crazy ideas of evolving from nothing and a big bang theory in millions of years. Uh, even when you've got fossils going through polystrate fossils and everything like that. We know all this now. Why? Because ministries like that occur. So I'm very appreciative of those ministries. But Christians need to be more awake because 
It happens in all areas of life, right? It happens in all areas of science and all fields where, you know, we are asleep. We're asleep at the wheel. We're letting the world indoctrinate other people. We're letting the world get away with these arguments. And we are too busy in our brave new world, right? Taking the soma of the world, just pacified, not even realizing the fight that is going on. And guys, we need to wake up to the fight. Right? We need to wake up, we need to get involved. You need to stop just living for yourself and just living for the pleasures of this life because that's what Christians have done. They've gone asleep at the wheel. And maybe because you know, we buy into this idea of, oh, you know, we take for granted that we have eternal life. We take for granted that, hey, no matter how bad things happen, we'll eventually escape and things like that. So we don't care how bad the world is getting. In the meanwhile, we complain about, oh, you know, why do I have all these requirements for my job? Why do I, why is it like this? Why are you know, all these babies getting killed in abortion? Why is my life so hard? Why am I taxed to death? Well, it's because we're not involved, right? That's why we, we need to be involved. We need to make our voice known, especially in a de democratic country like ours. So we need to understand that Genesis is literal history. And Jesus he did acknowledge Genesis as literal history. So you don't have to wonder, hey, is it just an interpretation of our church? Is it just something that a fringe minority of Christians believe? Unfortunately, no, Jesus actually acknowledged when, when he was asked the question about marriage, right? He based it in literal history. He said, he answered and said unto them, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause, shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god hath joined together let not man put asunder now if there was no literal adam and eve why would jesus be basing his argument on the fact that there was an adam and eve so the fact that there was an adam and eve can say, well, this is, what, this is the basis for marriage. This is the basis for one man, one woman. This is the basis for marriage being a lifelong union. And the same reasoning is, well, because there is one man and one woman that gave birth to all living, like Eve is called the mother of all living, there is no such thing as different races. We are all one big physical family. You know, when we talk about the church family, you know, we start talking about spiritually, right? Spiritually, uh, we are one family because we are born again, right? So we're technically, well, to be technical, we all descend from a common ancestor, right? Because, you know, family, families start when you leave father and mother and then you have an independent family. But we are all descended from the same two ancestors. So there isn't different ancestors that evolved along the way that these different races come from. Paul as well, which is where we started in Acts 17. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Look at this. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So am I saying here that we shouldn't be disgusted at people that are racist? See, this is the ironic thing about the Black Lives Movement and people that are sort of champion for equality in different races, because ultimately they're, they're the ones that are being racist. The fact that they even look at human beings as different races is the fact that they, they acknowledge that races even exist. See, the people that deny that races are even there and they're just all people of different nations and different cultures, you know, these are the people that are being racist because they don't even acknowledge that race, races exist. But we see here that even Paul is saying, God hath made of one blood all nations of men. So it's not he's made of one blood all races of men. All nations of men, because the Bible does acknowledge that people come from different nations. But you are not necessarily, because you can change nations. Right? When it talks about races, we're, we're talking about somebody's genetic disposition, right? as opposed to their, their um, eth ethnic affiliation or their national affiliation. For to dwell on all the face of the earth and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So I like it when people talk about 
you know, they, when they say, uh, you know, we, they say, um, you know, we may have different shades of skin, but we all bleed the same color. We all bleed red. So it's kind of, it's like here, you know, we all have the same color blood, even though we may look different on the outside. So let me just get on to my last point. Like today's sermon's not as long. But nations in the Bible are not the same as races. And remember, racism can only exist as a philosophy of evolution. And this is why Christians that have attempted to fit evolutionary theory to the Bible will have trouble disputing all with these races. Because then where did these races come from? Because, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Unless they try and say, well, evolved and eventually you got to man and woman, you know, Adam and Eve. And then they have all sorts of other theological problems with that theory as well. But the people who promote racism generally have to argue it from, you know, a, you know, because they're evolved differently and whatnot. That's why these races even exist, because nobody, like I said, in their right mind would call people who are descended from the same two people different races. So let's talk about nations in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, because you might think, well, you know, I'm, you know, you, we talk about, you know, I'm Greek or I'm Italian or I'm Indonesian or Malaysian and whatnot. These are not races of people, right? What makes you Greek? What makes you Italian? It's not the color of your skin, you know, because even in Italy, there would be black and white people, you know, and, and yellow people probably as well, you know, what people would determine. Or in, in Greece as well. In, in Mexico, there's all different shades. In Asian countries, there's all different shades as well. You know, there are darker skinned people as well because you've got the Indians and Indian Malaysians and then you've got the Chinese Malaysians. 1 Corinthians 12. So here, when the Bible talks about Jews and Gentiles, this is not the recognition of races. This is what the Bible would recognize as different nations of people. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So you say Jews, but aren't Jews, you say, yeah, aren't Jews, isn't that like a physical descendant? Because it's like if you're descended from Israel, or you're descended from Abraham. So Jews, so, you know, why, why are Jews called Jews? I'll, I'll go into that in a moment. But what I want to show you here, that this idea of a Jew is not a physical characteristic, right? It's not a, it's not a descendant. And I'll show you here, because in essay, because if it was a descendant, if being a Jew was your descendants from a common ancestor, then that means if you are not descended from that person, then you could not be a Jew, right? You could never be a Jew. But the fact of the matter is, in Esther 8, if you remember the story of Esther and Mordecai and Haman, when you know Haman tried to kill all the Jews and then another law was passed so they could defend themselves and all that sort of stuff, well, you get to Esther 8, when fear of the Jews is coming on the people. And look at what it says here. And in every province, in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. Look at this. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now, can you just become a descendant of somebody just because you want to, because you're worried about God? Of course not. So you see how it's not a descendant. It's that they, like they joined the nation. Right, so I don't know exactly what the rules are to join the nation. Maybe you keep the Passover, maybe you have to get circumcised, but you, you join that nation and maybe there are certain requirements uh, put on you in order to, to be part of that nation. And I believe it's those sort of things in the Bible. So it's not a race of people. It's not even though people, Jew, Jews are not even people descended from a common ancestor. Right? Now, when John the Baptist was saying to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, say not within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. You know, they're talk that, that reference is about them thinking about you know, Abraham's promises and descending from Abraham. So they thought it was about a physical descendant, that their physical descendants of Abraham would help them in regards to their salvation and give them some sort of privilege. You know, people talk about white privilege. They, they, had, they thought they had the Jew privilege, you know, the Abrahamic privilege. But... John the Baptist obviously put them in their place and say, hey, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. There is no privilege just because you are physically descended from somebody. But a Jew is not even somebody that is physically descended from Abraham. And we'll 
talk about what a Jew is in a moment. I'll show you some passages there. Now, what does the word Gentiles mean? So you've got Jews and Gentiles. You know, are these referring to different races of people? No, it's different nations. So you have the nation of Israel, which is where Jews come from. And then what does Gentiles mean? Well, with some words in the Bible, you don't need to go to a dictionary to figure it out because when it's re-quoted in other places in the Bible, you can see how it's quoted. So I want to show you here where Gentiles is quoted in another passage of the Bible and you can, get a, and you can understand what Gentiles means. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. So this is that famous verse in Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Now look at how it's quoted in Luke 12. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. So when you see Jews and Gentiles, it is talking about Jews referring to that nation that God had chosen in the Old Testament, but is no longer the chosen people of God. And Gentiles is just referring to every other nation that is not Jewish, right? It's not the nation of the Jews. So we see there easily Gentiles is nations of the world, so the other nations out there. Now, where do we get the different languages? So you say, hey, well, you know, is it, is these different nations have all these different languages. So not only is there the nat natural geographical movement of people after the flood or people after they are born from uh, Adam and Eve, but you have a supernatural event happen as well at the Tower of Babel where because the world was of one language and they were coming together and they were starting to think that they could be God. You know, to build that tower represents, you know, them reaching Godhood. That God decided it best for man to split them up into even more divided nations and actually you know, give different languages. So that, that, this event happens in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babylon. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they, have, and they have all one language. So you see, unity does come by one language. But you know, God saw it fit that there would be different languages to divide up people because the more people are unified, the faster this you know, one world government comes in these end times. And this they begin to do. So he's like, hey, when they're all united, what happens? They start thinking they're God. They start all doing all these sorts of things, this idolatry and whatnot. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And it's just, a, it's just funny where you read things like this in Genesis 11 and God saying things like, well, there's nothing that I've restrained them to do. Who would have thought when Genesis 11 was penned down that we would have things like you know, the robotics and the technology we have today and, um, you know, even people like Elon Musk saying, hey, you better beware what you do with artificial intelligence. You know, is that, is that, a, is that a force if we create that can, that can be controlled? And, you know, that's why, I mean, I, I sort of start to change my mind on those things. Because I always, I always thought, you know what, surely a machine, an AI machine, cannot become self-aware or whatever. It cannot do things... It can be under our because ultimately a man programs it. But then you think, but if man programs an infinite learning loop, what do they unleash? Do you know what I mean? So it's just, I don't know what man is unleashing on itself by dabbling into AI and creating these algorithms, these self-learning algorithms, because even though the, the mind of a man and the brain of a human being has a lot of potential, generally we, can, we cannot harness the potential of it. But when it's no longer dependent on your, your physical capability and your own energy, it's just the amount of electricity that gets pumped into it and the computing capability. You know, I, I don't know what sort of world that's going to create and, um, you know, and, 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 and how it will be used to persecute Christians uh, in, the, in the coming times. But, you know, we, we ought not to fear these things, guys. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying it because it's, it's interesting to think about. Um, but, you know, we ought not to live in the spirit of fear. You know, we ought to just keep st striving forward and when whatever comes, comes. But, um, you know, for those, the, for the people that are dabbling in that, um, yeah, I, I do wonder how they are going to keep these things under control and whether, you know, a, a matrix-like future is, is inevitable if they keep going down that road. 
So nothing which they have imagined from them, which they have imagined to. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city, because right, they couldn't communicate with each other anymore. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So people that study languages, you know, they've tried to think, hey, what were these, maybe these common root languages that have now evolved into the different languages we find today? And that's why language is so similar, because, you know, even though you have different languages, the way sentences are structured, you know, verbs, the tenses, and all these sorts of things are common across all these languages, because you know, it goes back to the point, the fact that people did all speak one language at one point, and then it just slightly altered as they, they, they were given different languages. But how we communicate is very similar. But, you know, what language was Adam and Eve speaking? You know, what language was Noah speaking on the ark with his family? I guess that's something we'll never really know. I guess that's something we'll have to ask when we get to heaven. Um, you know, some people believe that it's Hebrew, you know, because it's just, is that the pure language that continued on? I don't think so. I think maybe the Hebrew language was just something that, you know, came later, you know, and Abraham must have been speaking and or whatnot. But, you know, uh, obviously that we don't know what language was spoken beforehand. So there's no point being dogmatic on why it might be. People can have their theories, but I haven't really heard any strong biblical arguments to say, hey, this was the language that was before. And what language will we speak in the future? You know, will there be one language? Because surely, um, you know, will it just be that everybody can speak everybody's language? And it's just you have a mo you, you instantly become knowledgeable of all different languages. You know, like the Holy Spirit gave the gift of tongues. Maybe in the new world, will we all be able to speak these different languages? Or will there be one language that we all speak? Will, will it be English? Because that's the, the language that the Bible is written in. <laughs> just kidding. But who knows? what that language is going to be, but it'll be interesting to find out when we get there. So nations, not uh, different races. So what makes you Greek, Italian, Indonesian, English, Australian? Think, through, think this through with me. If it's genetics, and it's kind of like the whole thing with the same the skin color, right? If it's genetics, then what were you before the nation existed? You know, because most of us, when we say, oh, I'm this or I'm that, I mean, these nations didn't exist till the beginning of time. I mean, here, Genesis 11, what were those nations called then? And nations were called after different people, and then they, you know, conquering and all these wars that go on, and then a nation's established. I mean, we all consider ourselves Australians. Australia, as a nation, is only 100 years old. You know, it's a relatively young nation. So it's just, it, it blows my mind when I think about these things. And we think about, oh, this is just how the way it's always been. But really, it's only been like that maybe for like the last three generations. So what could it change to in the generations to come? If it's genetics, what were you before then? What, what if it's birth location? You say, well, the nation I'm a part of, the race I am, it's based on my birth location. And that's what makes me the nation I'm a part of. So then the question is, well then, does that mean Simon is a different nation to Elizabeth? Oh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Simon are the same nation, and I'm a different nation. But then Simon's brothers and sisters are a different nation just because the parents moved when they, you know, gave birth to children. So, so if you were like a father that sort of moved to work, would all your children be part of all these different nations? You know, sometimes they are citizen-wise, but that doesn't make them different races, right? You know, so... You've got to think, like, what makes you that? Is it your birth location? If it's your birth location, um, then, you know, people within the same family can be different nations. What if it's your current location? If it's your current location, then technically we would all be Australians. Then it wouldn't make sense for people in here to say, I'm Greek and Italian or whatnot, because we all live in Australia under this nation. But then you say, well, what makes me English or Greek or Italian or Chinese? It's my cultural traditions. It's my cultural traditions that makes me that. Well, then my question is, well, what happens when you stop those traditions? You know, like what happens when, you know, like my, a lot, my family has a lot of traditions. What happens when I stop doing them? Am I still Chinese? People say like, 
you know, people say to me, oh, Victor, obviously you're Chinese, look at you, right? So there's things like that. We say, well, if, Chinese, if, if it's not the way I look and it's what I do, well, what happens when I stop doing this? And then the question of pure-bloodedness comes, right? It's like, well, how closely must you adhere to those cultural obliga obligations to be considered that? And then you ask the question, well, who even determined those cultural obligations to begin with? Who even defined that you know, a Greek is, you must do this, do this, do this, that an Asian does this? And this is why there's even disagreement. You know, I, I hear different things from my mom and my dad because it's like, oh, this is what you have to do as a Chinese person. And, this is, and sometimes they conflict. Or sometimes they, one person thinks they're stupid. Ah, oh, you know, you don't really need to do those things. That does not make you Chinese. You know, the, this is the minimum you have to do to China. So it's just this floppy ruler that means nothing in the end. You know, that's, that's how I think. So, and then if it's uh, your religious affiliation, is that what makes you part of the nation? Well, then we should all be part of the nation of Israel as Christians. So, what make what is a Jew? Why are they called Jews? I don't know if you guys know. Well, why why are the Jews called Jews? If not every uh, body under Abraham is called a Jew, where do they get this name from? Well, where the name Jews come from, it is a shortened name of the nation of Judah. Right, so if you remember when Rehoboam took over the kingdom from Solomon, and you remember the story where the, wife, the older men came to him and said, look, your father Solomon made it very difficult for us. If you would just lighten the load on the people, hey, they will continue to serve you. So then Rehoboam goes and talks to his mates, and they tell him, oh, you know, you've got to come down hard on them, you know, show them who's boss, kind of thing. And then he says, you know, like, my little finger is going to be like my dad's thigh. You know, it's how tough. So... Here we get into 1 Kings 12, 16, where it says, So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house. You know, take care of your own business, right? David. So Israel departed unto their tents. So what is he saying here? What are they saying here? They're saying, hey, you know, to hell with you. You know, and they say, you know, Dave, what he says, when he says, David, see to thine own house, David, what is he talking? He's talking about the lineage of David, which is Rehoboam, right? So he's saying, okay, well, you know, rule yourself then, and we're going to go away. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So you see, that's where you get this split between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. It might be the other way around, right? I can't remember which, which way that goes around. You got Judah, and then you got Israel. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones. So what happens after this split? Rehoboam sends the IR, you know, or the, the ATO, right, to go collect taxes. And then what happens? They stone that guy to death, right? That he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So he goes back to the capital city. Of Judah. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. So at this point, we see all the other tribes have now appointed Jeroboam as king. Rehoboam is just ruling over Judah. But see here, verse 21, when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah, look at this, with the tribe of Benjamin. So what happens here is that Judah, no, Ju Rehoboam's reigning over Judah. The rest of the tribes go on to Jeroboam, but Judah, the tribe of Judah and with Rehoboam, successfully convinced B Benjamin to rejoin the kingdom of Judah, right? So Benjamin joins up with Judah and they become what's known as the nation of Judah, and then the Israelites become, and in the capital city of Samarita, Samaria, and they interbreed and whatnot, become the Samaritan line. But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of the Lord and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. 
So this is what a Jew is. A Jew is somebody from the nation of Judah as opposed to the Samaritans. So that's why when you read in the New Testament, why are the Jews and the Samaritans at odds? Because these are the descendants, right? Or these are the people that are of these two nations, of this split nation. Samaritan went into captivity, all got mixed up, so it didn't even really exist anymore. And then Judah went into captivity, and that's where you get the Jews. So it's a short nickname of people of the nation of Judah. But remember, people of the nation of Judah included people from the nation of Benjamin as well. And this is why, I don't know if you guys think about this. I thought about this because I was studying for this. This is why the Apostle Paul is a Jew. Because you say the Apostle Paul, well, he wasn't of the tribe of Judah. He was of the tribe of Benjamin in Philippians 3. It says here, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. So he's an Israelite, meaning he's descended from Jacob, of the tribe, which son of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews. But why is Paul considering himself a Jew? Because he was of the nation of Judah, even though he was of the tribe of Benjamin, because Judah was those two tribes combined. And why are they called Hebrews? Because that's the language that they speak, right? So that's why you have the book of Hebrews. So he's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's, a, he's descended from Israel, but he's of the tribe of Benjamin, but he's still considered a Jew. As touching the law, a Pharisee. So in the Bible, nations are not races. You know, we have one race, the human race. Nations are not different races. They, they are an affiliation you have with the country that you have your allegiance to, right? So, so to us, we are physically, we are Australians. That's where our allegiance is like. But spiritually, you know, we are part of the true nation of Israel, the Commonwealth of Israel, and we are citizens of God's true nation. And that's why spiritually we are Jews. Those are the real Jews, because the nation of Israel no longer exists, right? That fake nation of Israel is not really the nation of Israel. That's just something I think the United Nations put together. Um, but when the, United, when, the, when the real Israel comes together, what the Bible is talking about is people turning back to the Lord and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So just one last verse I want to show you is Colossians 3. Uh, here in verse 8. Just uh, some closing thoughts. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. So what I want to say here is, you know, Jesus is the answer to racism. Right? Whether it is... The fact that biblically we recognize that there is no such thing as races. Or if people have in their mind and they associate races, races with different nations, within Jesus Christ there should be no different nations. right? We are all one nation in Jesus Christ and that's why it talks about there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. So people realizing they are one blood, people realizing they are from one family, you know, and all those who are saved are all part of the same nation. So if we realize these things, you know, and we help people to understand these things, hopefully we can get this idea of races out of people's minds and, um, you know, people would not be discriminated based on it. All right, those are my thoughts. I hope you learned something there. Uh, let's pray. Lord, I just uh, thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the reminder that, um, Lord, that this evolutionary concept of different races has permeated our society. And I pray, Lord, um, that you would help us to help others see that, uh, Lord, we should not look at people just because of the concentration of pigment, of melanin in their skin. Lord, but we should see each other as human beings and judge. We should judge, Lord, people based on the nation that they come from and the philosophies that they hold, uh, not their physical attributes, which they had no control over. So, Lord, I pray for these things and pray, Lord, that um, you know, you would keep the police safe during these times. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, this, this Black Lives Matter movement will, um, you, know, you know, either be called by another name or, Lord, they, they would shift their focus. And, uh, Lord, that you would distinguish, help to people to distinguish between those that have uh, good motives and those that don't. So, Lord, we uh, thank you for gathering us here today. Pray that you'll bless the rest of our time here. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.